when I was 11 reading a book about Galileo that really mm. had a big impact. He seemed like a heroic figure. And the space and time that comprises our universe did not exist. Lawrence Krauss, welcome to New Jersey, sir. It's so great. I think this is the first time I've been in Hoboken. Really? I was trying to remember if I've been in Hoboken before. I don't think so. This is, this is my first. It'll be memorable. Didn't you grow up right over here? I was born right over there, but oh. I moved out when I was three months old. I said, I don't want to live here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you made that decision. Where, where... I grew up in Canada. You grew up in Canada? In, in Toronto, yeah. So you're a true Canadian. I'm at, Well, I'm a sort of semi-true Canadian. Yeah, I actually um, uh, became Canadian, although when I, my parents mm. became Canadian, I thought I'd lost my American citizenship. In fact, when I came back to graduate school at MIT, I was on a visa. Really? And, and yeah, I was on a visa all, all the time. And then I got my first job at Harvard and, and I tried to get permanent residency. And the Harvard lawyer said, we think you're a citizen. Yeah. I, I, well, is I, that you possible know, to lose it? Well, at that time, you apparently could. You see, my parents became Canadian. They lost their American citizenship uh, because at the time you had to renounce your citizenship in order to become citizen of another country. But mm. because I was a kid, I didn't suffer for the sins of my parents and... And I, anyway, so I, I, the Harvard lawyer said, you know, you can find out by applying for a passport, which I did, got my passport, tore up my visa. And uh, anyway, so I'm a citizen of both, I'm a citizen of both countries. But yeah, you don't have a Canadian accent. I don't detect that's that really. it. Well, so every now and then, if I say about or something, I guess I do. But, but then, you know, I don't know what my accent is, but uh, some people say they can hear the Canadian accent. I think Canadians hear an American accent, but I lived in the U.S. longer than Canada. I grew up in Canada, but then I moved in my 20s to go to graduate school, and then I lived in the U.S. Mm. continuously until two years ago and moved back to Canada. Mm. When you were a kid, when, when did you first get bit by the science bug and the meaning, the meaning of it all? Well, you know, it's, I've, I've tried to think of that a lot because my, uh, uh, my mother wanted me to be a doctor and my brother to be a lawyer, of course. And, and uh, so she told me doctors were scientists. So I think from a little time I was a little kid, since I thought I wanted to be a doctor, I was interested in science, but I, the, I, I really remember when I was 11 reading a book about Galileo that really mm. had a big impact. He seemed like a heroic figure, and I thought all scientists were heroic figures. I've discovered that's not true. But uh, So I got into that, and then it was in high school when I realized that doctors weren't scientists, but I was kind of <laughs> hooked on it. Last month, I had in my friend Dr. Brian Keating for episode 173 of the podcast. I really appreciate all the amazing feedback we had on that one. It won't be the last episode we do together. I really enjoyed talking with Brian. He's such a smart guy and obviously very keyed into the entire physics community in addition to physics. But in that episode, almost 84% of the people who watched were not subscribed. And so what happens when we have a lot of non-subscribers watching who aren't hitting the button is YouTube does not put these videos into the algorithm. So that episode did fine, but it didn't do amazing despite the fact that the click-through, the watch time were all great, and like I said, the feedback was awesome. So if you'd like to see this podcast, get into the algorithm more and get some more support behind it so that we can get great guests like Brian to come in here, please take a second and hit that subscribe button. It is a huge, huge help, and I appreciate all of you who have already done so. And, and I, I read a book in high school by a, a physicist named Sir James Jeans. It was called Physics and Philosophy, and that really um, convinced me. So I, I knew I wanted to do science, but I wasn't convinced that that's all I wanted to do. I did history. I took a year off school to work on a Canadian history book, and there oh, were a lot really? of things I, I, I thought I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to eventually... Understanding the fundamental features of the universe just seemed like the sort of sexiest thing you could do. And so I always knew I'd go back to it. And I, I, I applied for my, to graduate school and, uh, and didn't know if I'd get in anywhere, but I got into MIT. I also could, I was going to go to Oxford on a Rhodes Scholarship to do physics and philosophy, but I'm mm -hmm. so happy I didn't. Why? I, well, I think philosophy is the kind of thing you get enamored with when you're young and then you grow out of it. And, mm. and, and uh, at least I did. And so I went to do physics at MIT, and I didn't think I'd get a job. There were no jobs, and I, I got my PhD in early 80s, and uh, before you were born probably. But anyway, yes. um, uh, and there were no jobs, so I, I sort of learned how to juggle and drive a taxi and things like that. But it turned out I got... I was at Lucky, and I got a good job at Harvard. And then but when out. you, but when, especially at the higher end of education, when you're studying something like that, don't your jobs generally go into academic research and, and things yeah, like that. Yeah, but there were no jobs in academia at that time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just remember it was it, the likelihood of getting a professorship. I mean, it's always small, but it just seemed very remote. 
and it was a gamble. But I, but, and I tell kids nowadays who want to, you know, they want to know what whether they'll get jobs in this or that. You never know, first of all. But just do what you're interested in, and and mm. the training you get will be useful for whatever you're going to do. And 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 to try and choose a career because you think there's going to be a job in it is, first of all, you don't know down the road, and secondly, it's what if you get you choose something you don't like and you get a job in it? What how awful is that to spend your so anyway, uh, it worked out. It was a gamble, but it worked out in the end. And now here you are, published a bunch of published yeah. books later, uh-huh. years and years in the space, doing all kinds of research. But the the calling card that you're known for oh. is uh, what is it? I is like the know. concept <laughs> of you thinking that everything came from oh, nothing? Oh, that yeah, uh-huh. which is really hard. It is it, even as even as someone obviously I'm not a scientist, mm-hmm. but as a layman, sometimes mm-hmm. if I'm walking down the street and I start thinking about the kind of decision trees of where mm-hmm. everything could have started, mm-hmm. I then get stressed because I'm like, oh my god, it could have all never happened and there would have been nothing. Yeah. But then you think about nothing and you're like, well, wait a minute, F- nothing is nothing, but that's still something because if you're picturing right. nothing, you're picturing like an empty that, room. That's well, that's the you you got you really do understand it uh, because. It's nothing, it's is really hard to understand, and everyone has a different definition of it. And I had to talk about that when I wrote the book, because you're right, an empty room seems like nothing, but it's not nothing. Mm-hmm. The the nothing of the Bible, which a lot, you see, a lot of religious, religious people like to say, oh, well, you're not really discussing nothing, you really need God to make something. But the nothing of the Bible really is an infinite empty void, so it's like empty space. What do you mean by that? Well, I'm, if you read the Bible, the nothingness was an empty void. And if you think the best example of that is like space with nothing there, but then where did the space come from? Yeah. And and so when I talk about a universe from nothing in, in the book, what I really meant, and I still mean, is no space, no time. Everything that we see and everything in the universe that we see within the universe and the space and time that comprises our universe did not exist. And then it suddenly came into existence. And now, how did that happen? Well, I can tell you plausibly how it happens because okay. we don't have a theory of quantum gravity. But if you if gravity is qu- is governed by quantum mechanics, gravity, well, quantum mechanics things says that things are fluctuating all the time. The variables of of, the, of quantum mechanics and in, in gravity, if it's a quantum theory, the variables of gravity are space and time. Mm. So if gravity is a quantum theory, then then virtual universes, virtual space times. Think of the universe as like a ball. It can pop into existence and go out of existence in a short time. It ha- that's what happens right now. If you take space right now, it's full of virtual particles popping in and out of existence. We know that. We can't measure them directly because they're virtual, but they produce effects that you can measure. And we can mm. predict those effects, and they're the best measured predictions in all of science. The properties of atoms, the spectra of atoms, we can predict to, in some sense to 11 decimal places and if you didn't include the effect of virtual particles, you get the wrong answer. But if you do, you get the right answer. It's the best measured prediction in all of science. So we know these virtual particles pop in out of existence, and they determine the properties of atoms. They determine the properties of elementary particles. But if, if gravity is a quantum theory, then virtual universes are popping in and out of existence all the time. Most of them you know, are in, in, in existence for a fraction of a second. I mean, unbelievably small fraction. Like in our time. Well, even in our time, they could exist and, and go out of existence. But some of them can exist for a long time if they have zero total energy. Because if, they, if you have a virtual particle that suddenly exists and continues to exist, it violates energy conservation, right? If the mm. particle had a mass, that's why they have to disappear in a time so short you can't measure them. But in certain conditions, like near a black hole, as Stephen Hawking showed, virtual particles and antiparticles can spontaneous appear, but one of the particles can fall into a black hole, losing more energy than the rest mass of the particle that remains, so you don't violate energy conservation, and black holes evaporate. That's called Hawking 